Hello. Uh, welcome to this uh, new webinar series co-hosted by the National Good Food Network and the National Farm to Institution Metrics Collaborative. I am joined by Hannah Layton uh, from Farm to Institution New England and our moderator for today, Colleen Matz from the MSU Center for Regional Food Systems, who are helping to facilitate on behalf of the collaborative. Uh, the National Good Food Network, coordinated by the Wallace Center at Winrock International, convenes good food professionals in communities of practice to share best practices, solve problems, and continue, continually re-energize. One of these communities of practice is around farm to institution metrics. The organization in the National Farm to Institution Metrics Collaborative work across the country to measure and track the impact of the institutional market from producer to buyer. The group started in 2014 and now has 30 members based in 20 states, working at municipal, county, multi-county, state, regional, and national levels. The collaborative hold, holds quarterly calls and occasional in-person meetings, offers opportunities for collaborative partnership, and provides a platform for sharing best practices. Also, uh, we share foundational metrics terminology, tools, and resources. At the end of the webinar, we'll share some information on how to access resources and information on the collaborative. These monthly 30-minute webinars are designed to provide a national audience of farm to institutional pra institution practitioners, supporters, and advocates with the tools they need to measure farm to institution efforts in a meaningful way. So I'm just going to hand it over uh, to Yusuf Bouzeyan from Community Alliance with Family Farmers, who's going to introduce CAF uh, and the other panelists today. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff, and thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar today. Uh, we'll have presentations from Daylight Foods, Project Waste Not, and the Community Alliance with Family Farmers. So before we jump into the data network, we all wanted to tell you a little bit about ourselves and our organizations. I am the Farm to Cafeteria Coordinator at the Community Alliance of Family Farmers, also known as CAF, and CAF is a nonprofit based in California. CAF advocates for family farms and sustainable agriculture. We strive to build a movement of rural and urban people to foster family scale agriculture that cares for the land, sustains local economies, and promotes social justice. This is done through our policy advocacy, climate smart farming, food safety programs, and our farm to market program. And as the farm to cafeteria coordinator, I work with hospitals, universities, colleges, school districts, farms and distributors to increase access to family farm products in cafeterias, as well as analyzing farm to cafeteria purchasing and procurement institutions. My name is Jenna. I work with Daylight Foods. Daylight Foods is a distribution company. We primarily do produce distribution based in the California Bay Area. Um, and my role at Daylight, in the past I was the director of our school program, and now I am the director of our sustainability. Hi, I'm Neil Bram. I'm the founder of Project Waste Not. At Project Waste Not, we believe that improving the flow of information is critical to improving the food system. Uh, so what we've done is we've built some technology and capabilities to make it easy for the many different players in the food supply chain to share and exchange information and data, all from within the systems they're currently using. Okay, so I'm gonna talk just briefly about sort of the, <clears throat> the why, what was this problem that we were trying to fill. So uh, at Daylight, we work with about 40 K through 12 school districts and five universities. Um, we had a lot of requests from our customers to have more traceability, more reporting. Um, they wanted sort of like monthly sustainability reports to see where each box of kale or lettuce was coming from. Um, from a conventional distribution standpoint, that provided a really big challenge for us. Um, we were running reports basically by hand, manually, every time someone was looking for something, <clears throat> like a monthly report. And the way that our inventory was managed, what we were really doing was making our best guess estimates for um, where product was coming from. Um, so we realized we had a big gap in what we wanted to be able to do, um, and we didn't, we didn't really have the tools to be able to provide our customers with the kind of data that they were looking for. Um, and CAF introduced us to Project Waste Not, who helped us build some more tools. That, like, basically, the data exists in the food system because 
for food safety purposes. We knew that it was out there. We just couldn't figure out how to do it in a uh, less cumbersome way. And at CAF, we noticed that school districts and uh, universities and hospital cafeterias had some challenges in understanding where their food was uh, was being was their food sourcing was coming from, and the impact that had on limiting uh, sales from family farms and other sustain sustainable suppliers was, uh, was rather large. So our initial not really workable solution was uh, to work through a very manual process of tracking, as Jenna was kind of discussing earlier. Uh, so we'd get older style usage reports and velocity reports, and that involved calling various distributors, and then once we would receive those reports, we'd go through them manually and highlight items that were sourced from family farms and uh, local and locally sourced products. So it was a very um, slow, uh, slow process, and we needed a way to get ahead of the curve. So we didn't want to just provide information about historical family farm and local sales, but we really wanted to have a way to get more uh, timely and up to date sales information. And and so uh, when I hear Jen and Yusef talk, what I hear is a lot of pain around getting information. And when we look at the technology used in the food supply chain, we see there's, there's some big strategic problems causing these pro th this pain. There's a lot of systems being used. Growers and vendors use systems. The distributors use systems. Uh, the end customer, whether it's a school, institution, retail, restaurant, they're all using systems that are collecting information that's valuable for other players in the supply chain, but they can't really communicate effectively these systems. There's a barrier, there's a gap that stops them uh, from being able to share that information. Uh, and that gap is what's contributing to some of the pain that, that you're hearing. It's the big barrier to transparency. Whether, what, even when there's a will, uh, this gap is, is a big problem that, that makes it harder to share all this information. And it has some very real impacts. Uh, it limits sustainability by blocking information that says, hey, there's local product available or there's organic product available. It really adds to labor costs because the solution ends up being a very manual process of exchanging this information. And, and for us, most disappointingly, it really reduces innovation because you need information to innovate and solve the problems in our food supply chain. So we went out and the technology we built is essentially a food data exchange where each player in the supply chain through their own system can pass information to a central exchange and then share it with other players. So a grower can pass information that a distributor see or a distributor can pass information that a school can see. Always with some basic criteria, the owners of that data maintain complete control over who has access to the data. And everyone can keep working with their own system. We put a lot of effort into making it easy and building up the capabilities to make it uh, easy for different systems to integrate into the network. And so what I'm actually going to show you is, is, is the solution we built using this technology where we're pulling data directly out of a distributor system, the system that Daylight is using, pulling it in. We're now working to add more data from the grower system and then make it all available in automated, uh, automated sustainability reports. So let's quickly take a look at what, what those look like. So here we're looking at a report that uh, Daylight's customers can see. In this case, it's uh, San Francisco Unified School District. Uh, and it's a quick summary of their purchase history for a given period of time. And they have the ability to pick their own key metrics for what they define as sustainable. So let's just quickly update it where they sit there and say, we want to know who's organic, we want to know who's considered a family farm, and maybe they define local as, say, 250 miles. And that quickly, in real time, all that data gets pulled in, and now uh, San Francisco Unified School District has the information they need to start to make business decisions. In this case, it's just a quick dashboard. You could take the, the same tool uh, allows looking at uh, sustainable items as a second report where this shows you of the items that meet this definition has it break down so 11 percent uh, of their sustainable purchases during this time period uh, are strawberries so on 
Uh, and then we have an all items report that looks at each item uh, and looks at uh, what percentage each item is uh, is sustainable. Again, always according to the, this this definition. And then Neil, could you change it to sort by total? Sure. So now it's um, uh, it's it's total purchases for that given product. So this was a really great tool that Neil built in that has provided already an opportunity to have conversations with some of our customers. Um, so we're able to look at this and say, okay, well, what are your top purchase items? What percentage of those is coming locally? Like, so for example, um, if we looked here, we're saying like, you know, uh, I think the first one is oranges. Um, yep. That gives us the opportunity to then look at, we can see on the next tab that Neil will show you where those purchases are coming from. And it gives us the conversation, it, it starts the conversation of, well, California's, or, I mean, oranges grow in California. How can we get that number? That number could be closer to 100%. What do we need to change um, in order to help the schools achieve more local sourcing? Um, and then it also gives the school the data to then put some pressure on us to say, we want to only serve local oranges. What would it look like to make that happen? So you can see that this is a, a really great tool for starting those conversations and then for making some changes towards more local and sustainable purchases. Uh, and and the part of the point is, is, is once you can enable this information to flow and enable this data exchange, you can really customize the reports for different audiences. What we're showing you here is ideal for schools, but you could tweak it if the restaurants want to see something different or uh, daylight and the distributors want better tools to, uh, to manage their, their in-house operations. Or, you know, I, I showed you the first three uh, we could sit through and you can actually collect your detailed source for each product of, of uh, where it's coming from uh, uh, and download it. You really can uh, have the flexibility to uh, to pull data for, from your suppliers. You can do it in real time. You can customize your definition for metrics for the user uh, and customize it for the organization, whether it's a nonprofit, a school, a customer, a buyer. Uh, it all starts with, inf with the information flows. And you can go beyond sustainability reports. We focused on this but you could also use the same tools to do things like create availability reports. What local product is available for me as a school? Or what local product is available for me as a distributor serving those schools? Or uh, start to look at things like um, uh, bid generation and uh, automating ordering uh, so you don't have to pick up the phone or exchange files. It could all happen automatically because fundamentally we're connecting different systems and enabling those systems to communicate with each other. So what does it really take to get started? Uh, you know, we launched this in Northern California and a big reason this was able to happen was because we connected with Jenna and Daylight Foods. So uh, Jenna, do you want to share some perspective on, uh, on what you saw from your end? Yeah, I think for us, um, some of the big pushes for how this was able to happen is that because we had a lot of demand from our customers and from schools. Um, and so I think like one piece of encouragement is that if you are a school and this is something that you want, make sure that you're voicing that to the companies that you work with, because that really gave us, um, it gave me the support that I needed to then take this to our, you know, the president of our company and say, listen, this is something that our customers are asking for, we need to be able to to manage our data better. Um, so that was a big that was a, what what helped us make it happen. So, um, you know, uh, we found from our end that it's really two two big drivers, right? Uh, it really takes the the an advocate, as Jen is saying, customers wanting. In our case, we were lucky; we found a. Uh, Kath, Ben, and Yousef, uh, as well as Jenna, and both of them, uh, 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 they all helped push to, to, to make this happen in Northern California and get this started. Beyond that, we recognize that a lot of the people we're working with and a lot of the, 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 the players we're working with, 
you know, they're not in the business to be technologists. They're not in it to, uh, um, and often they don't always have the full range of capabilities and bandwidth to, to, uh, to solve the technology. So what, part of what we've done to be the second, second key driver to make this happen is we try to make the technology as easy as possible. We'll do a lot of the heavy lifting to, to make it easy to pull the data out of the different systems that the growers and the distributors and the uh, schools are using and enable that data exchange. Uh, so, uh, Yusef, do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about what you've seen now that you've been able to uh, use the system a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing we've noticed is it's very user friendly um, and we can look at information for a range of institutions fairly quickly. Um, in the past, uh, oftentimes working with a wide range of farms and schools and school districts, it's everyone can be on uh, very different systems. So some uh, institutions might do things very manually. I know some vendors might have older systems where they're giving uh, carbon copy uh, PDFs of, uh, of uh, receipts and uh, invoices and purchasing history. So not really having to deal with, uh, having to not sort through a range of uh, institutions and vendor systems is really nice having just one consistent source for your information instead of trying to understand the intricacies of, uh, of different institutions and vendors formats. Um, and it's just been a lot, a lot faster, um, not having to deal with making a bunch of different phone calls or sending a bunch of emails has been very helpful. And um, uh, the feedback we've been getting from the institutions we've been working with sending these reports is that it's really important to get this information in a timely manner so you can make your business decisions in, uh, in the right amount of time. You know, it, it's great sometimes to get, uh, you know, it's always helpful to look at your historical purchases, but being able to look at that information in a almost real time uh, and not having to have to sort through a bunch of different formats is it, really great. Awesome. Uh, Jenna, any, uh, any lessons learned you'd like to share? Yeah, I think for us, this has been a really informative process. Um, it helped us identify uh, some areas where we can continue to grow and encourage more local purchasing on our part. And I think one of the things that I sort of just, you know, a big take home for me is that like, this really is an ongoing and iterative process. Like the food system in general has traceability issues. And like, this is taking us a lot closer to where we wanna be. I think it has also identified some of the challenges in creating more traceability. Um, in terms of getting access to suppliers' data and information and, you know, the frustration of knowing that that information is there and um, that it is like we're slowly building that. Um, so I think that was sort of, you know, my takeaway is that this is like we can make a lot of progress and this is not a perfect solution yet. Um, but I'm really excited about uh, the steps that we've made to increase traceability. And I know that this will be a great tool for a lot of our schools. Awesome. You know, I couldn't agree more. I, I think I feel like we've seen uh, a lot of attempts in the past to come out with the perfect solution. Uh, and I think it's a key lesson learned that, you know, taking big, meaningful steps, even though you're going to have to take more and iterate to get to that to that ultimate solution, uh, that's, a, that's a, a absolutely key learning is to have that patience to go through those steps. Uh, the other thing that, that I feel like we learned is, is how important the people actually are, right? A big part of what made this happen was, was people stepping up and wanting to make it happen, right? Uh, and, and not just the want, but the added, it's, it's the more people are involved, the bigger the network gets, the bigger the network gets, the more ideas, the more, the more metrics we can identify that are wanted and useful, and the more solutions we can build off of those metrics. Uh, so, I mean, I probably, probably a good place to wrap up is just to leave it there saying, yeah, one of the key learnings is that, yes, the technology is important, that the metrics are important, but that a big part of it is really that the people are important. You know, people like Jenna and Yousef and Ben and our hosts, Hannah and Jeff and Colleen, right? It's, it's, uh, it really takes everyone to sort of build this network and identify all the great places you can get value out of it. 
Uh, and I'll, I'll say, uh, you know, if you're not involved already, I'm, this is my sort of way of encouraging you to help get involved and free the data so we can build a better food, food system. All right, well, thank you all for that helpful info. We have a couple of questions in the queue already, and both of them are kind of multi-part questions. The first one is, can you see this tool being used with broadline distributors, or are you already working with one or more? And if yes, how did you get them to release your data? The asker is curious. Uh, fair enough. So the answer is yes, we do see it working with broadline distributors. Uh, everything that's built into it, uh, well, what we showed you is all focused on produce. It absolutely works and is set up with uh, any any food item. Uh, some of it does depend on what size broadline distributor you talk about in terms of how easy or hard it is to get them to uh, release the data. But what we really find is it starts, with, again, with an advocate, someone who's stepping up uh, and saying, hey, we want this from a, a school, a customer, uh, and we start building around that to get uh, enough enough of them that it, it gets the distributor's attention and says, yeah, this is something my customers want. I, you know, uh, uh, as Jenna said before, you know, uh, you know, the distributors, you know, it, it's part of their motivation, obviously, is to provide service and value to their customers. And, and as they become aware that their customers want this, they, they start to look for that tool to do, to do so. And my own personal follow-up to that is when you are working with broadline distributors, do you have any kind of written agreement about how or where data would be used or shared? So we have a general agreement uh, that essentially gives the broadline distributor they retain all rights and ownership to their own to their own data uh, and then through any implementation process we work with them to identify who they want to share with and everyone has a different philosophy uh, some don't want to share price with anyone some only want to share price with their customers some are saying hey share my prices I don't you know I don't care uh, as an example of a sensitive data set and we you know we've really built into the system the controls to give them the flexibility to, to to share data as it aligns with their strategy and how they want to meet their customers' needs. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, at what point in the process does data get entered as from a family farm or with other characteristics about the product? And this question is getting at the workload that's required to get info into the system or get into the system. Uh, so the information gets in the system at, um, I guess, each step of the way. So uh, a grower producer uh, ideally would, would be using their existing farm management or CRM system, whatever systems they're currently using to, uh, 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 to manage their business. We would integrate with those systems and pull that data out. And then likewise, if you go up, sort of up, upstream, or I mean, I mean, I said the backwards, downstream, uh, your broker, distributors, whatever systems they're using, same thing. They're adding to the data set through the, the work, through their business operations as they add to, the, to the, their system, and we'll pull the data out at that point. And, and, uh, and then ultimately enable exchange between the two and then keep going forward. Same thing with the end customer, whatever system they're using. Uh, they're using it in, essentially in their normal operations to add information. This is what we want to order. This is what we grew. Uh, this is what we have available to sell. This is our price point. They enter that as they normally would, and we're just pulling it out and making it available. And then to so add into that. Oh, oh, go ahead, Jenna. Go ahead. I was like to add into that a little bit. Some of the things that we did for this iteration, and like Neil was saying, the goal is to pull all the data from our suppliers' systems. Obviously, we don't have all of our suppliers on board with that process yet. Um, so what we mm -hmm. have built in, um, is we have so we've hard coded some what we call rules. So for example, we have a list from Yusuf and CAF of what what uh, who qualifies as a family farm in California. So we have that data that basically when Neil's pulling the data from our system, it's cross checking with that information. And in terms of local farms and what we're counting and, and determining as local, um, Neil and I went through the process of looking at which suppliers we determined. Um, 
had adequate traceability. So these are, these are when we're buying direct from farms. If we're buying as daylight from a broker or somewhere where we're saying, at this point, I don't know where they got that case of oranges. We went and said that that was untraceable for now until we are able to pull data from their system, which will then tell us where that case came from. Um, so that's sort of what we went through for this iteration. And then sort of where we're going with this next iteration is targeting some of those suppliers where we don't have good data and figuring out how we can pull better data from their system. So I think you're getting at one of the follow-up questions that was asked about verification of the data that's entered. Is there anything else you would like to add about that? So because we're pulling from core management systems, uh, there's some built-in validity to the data. Uh, you'd have to put in a lot of effort to fudge the data because you're fudging it for all your internal reports, all your management tools. You know, we're right in, you know, we integrate with the sort of the core data set. So, uh, so there's some built-in validity. Uh, again, as we keep talking about, it's not a perfect system. It's, it's one big step forward. Uh, I'm sure if someone really wants to try to game the system, they could figure it out. And, uh, but it, it, there are some built-in challenges to do that. And then uh, to add into that, you know, there are some, uh, you know, this helped us identify some additional gaps and in, in things that we're going out to fill in. So like, yeah, for example, if you looked at the report, um, we're lucky enough that we fall into, um, most of our schools, the lettuce that we source for them comes from Taylor Farms, which happens to be local for us in California, even though they're a very large, you know, national lettuce producer. Um, so for part of the year, that lettuce is grown in Salinas, and for part of that year, that lettuce is grown in Yuma, Arizona. And right now, what we can say is we have an we have a, a an estimate. It's a you know plus or minus a couple days. We know when that transition period comes. When we integrate with Taylor's system, hopefully we'll be able to pull the data of exactly where that case of lettuce came from. So right now, what we have, um, sure, there would be places that you could poke holes, and this is sort of like uh, it's. It's again a step closer towards better traceability, um, but it has also helped us identify places where we still need even better data in order to tell this full story. And if I can add one thing to that, um, mm -hmm. a really crucial part of this is the more organizations and the more institutions and the more vendors and distributors and farms we can get into this system, the closer we're gonna be getting to re reaching that point that critical mass where we have enough information for this to be uh, an extremely useful tool. It's still it's still progressing and it's moving in that direction. But the more institutions we get into this, and the more distributors we get into this, and farms, just it's just going to be that much better, and the data is going to be that much more precise and that much more accurate. And the very last question that we have time for that hopefully has a very quick answer, is what is the general cost of setting up the tool for an institution? Uh, well, so far for all the institutions we're working on, um, uh, there hasn't been a cost, right? So that's the short answer. There's a little longer answer. A lot depends on, on um, the full range of functionality. Uh, for something like just sustainability reports, uh, there might be one price point. When you look at the full range of what the data exchange can do, uh, it really starts to depend on how you're how you're applying it, uh, uh, and also depends on a little bit on um, uh, who else in the market is 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 uh, is on the network. Gotcha. All right. Well, thank you, our presenters for this info today and thank all of our attendees for joining this the second webinar in our National Farm to Institution Metrics Collaborative webinar series. As Jeff mentioned, the collaborative is made up of leading farm to institution organizations from across the country who are coming together to share best practices for measuring the impact of institutional markets across the supply chain. And you can read more about the collaborative and access a sample of resources from our members by following the link on our screen there. And if you have any questions about the collaborative, you can email Hannah from FINE at hannah at farmtoinstitution.org. 
The next webinar in the series will be on Thursday, April 25th from 3.30 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, and it will feature Dr. Lillian Brislin of the Food Connection at the University of Kentucky. And Dr. Brislin will demonstrate the importance of identifying the what and why when establishing local food definitions and metrics. She'll be drawing on six years of the university's first private dining contract, and she'll share strategies, metrics, and hard-won lessons in developing effective local procurement initiatives at public institutions. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us.